I get a few extra minutes. He took too much time. <laughs> okay, uh, first of all, I want to apologize that I am completely colorblind to red, and I cannot see this pointer. So I'm going to have to use, can't quite reach it, so I'm going to have to use words to describe what I'm talking about. Okay, so necrotic enteritis is, is the big elephant in the room, I think, throughout North America and, and, and Europe um, right now. And, you know, largely because we've lost some of the tools that we've, we've had when we try to go to raise without antibiotics. Uh, some people say uh, ABF or antibiotic free. I don't know what the labeling is in Canada, but I, I really hate that terminology because it sounds like uh, birds that are not ABF are, they have antibiotics, and consumers associate that with something that's not true. Antibiotic residues are not, have not been the issue, right? It's, uh, so raised without antibiotics is probably a better uh, word for it. Um, there's a number, it's, this is really a, a multifaceted disease problem. Um, a shift in the gastrointestinal tract microbiota. Um, we call that dysbiosis. Veterinarians call it slimy gut. Um, and you can recognize that because of the increased mucin production, which uh, Clostridium perfringens is able to use as an energy source. The overwhelming issue uh, predisposing uh, for necrotic enteritis uh, undoubtedly is Imeria, um, mostly Imeria maxima. Um, necrotic enteritis is a disease of the small intestine, sometimes involving the distal duodenum, but mostly the jejunum and ileum um, and poultry. And it's, it's, uh, the easiest way to reproduce it is with Imeria maxima. Um, and we're going to talk about a couple of different Imeria maxima strains um, that uh, John Barda has helped us with in our laboratory. Um, diet is very important. Uh, Dietary factors that promote dysbiosis, that cause overgrowth of the wrong bacterial population, um, such as rapid changes in feed, um, least cost feed formulation by nutritionist. Um, it, yeah, it balances out, it has the same nutrient contents and so forth, but um, now it's a corn soy based diet. During the starter period, we move to the grower phase, and suddenly we've got enormous amounts of bakery byproduct meal high in non-starch polysaccharides, which promote overgrowth of, of, of disfavorable bacteria or dysbiosis. Um, animal proteins, fish meal, bone meal, meat meal, particularly those that have been overcooked, uh, have damaged proteins that are not digestible by the animal. And those also promote overgrowth of primarily gram-positive anaerobic bacteria uh, in the family Clostridiaceae. Um, Sudden withdrawal of antibiotics um, uh, has certainly been related to uh, the onset of ne necrotic enteritis. And the clostridial toxins themselves um, are probably important. Um, a lot of talk over the last few years about net B toxin and, and um, how that was the, the key. Um, we see necrotic enteritis in our part of the, of, of the world um, with net B negative strains, and we can induce necrotic enteritis with net B negative strains following even mild uh, Imeria maxima challenges. But I think the, the bottom line is if you can't control uh, the Clostridium perfringens with antibiotics, um, the next best thing is controlling the inciting, the overwhelming inciting factor, which is coccidia. Um, one point uh, that I thought I would make a, there was a very nice student presentation earlier showing that uh, many of the uh, clostridium perfringens isolates in Ontario were uh, resistant to bacitracin. BMD, which is a, a salt of bacitracin, um, has been commonly used throughout North America for control of necrotic enteritis, and it still generally works. Uh, we see uh, strains of uh, isolates of Clostridium perfringens that uh, are uh, definitely bacitracin resistant, but we see 50 grams per ton of bacitracin holding. That may be due to the anti-inflammatory effects of the bacitracin, the effect directly on the host, and may not be due to the antimicrobial activity. 
That's something that's being explored. There's a whole anti-inflammatory hypothesis of um, growth-promoting antibiotics and how they may work, which I think leads to hope that we're going to find other molecules that are not antimicrobial um, that may improve performance due to reduced inflammation in the gut. And of course, inflammation in the case of necrotic enteritis leads to increased mucin production, um, which is feed for Clostridiaceae. And we commonly see 10 to the fourth colony forming units per, per gram of digesta going up four logs very quickly when mucin production increases in the small intestine. So everyone is looking for prophylactics, um, uh, not, not, not just for uh, freshman college students anymore. Um, and, and so talk about some modeling on how we can test potential uh, feed additives, essential oils, prebiotics, probiotics, direct fed microbials. Everyone's got something that they think is going to help. And it's a multifaceted disease, so you actually have multiple phases where you could perhaps intervene uh, in the ability to, um, to uh, uh, mitigate necrotic enteritis. This is a paper we published uh, quite a few years ago um, that indicated that salmonella was not just for breakfast anymore. Um, it was actually predisposing for necrotic enteritis. And, um, we, we've got some new data that, that actually increases the, the interest in this. In these studies, on day of hatch, uh, chicks were either challenged or unchallenged with uh, salmonella type hemorrhea. At day 17, a, a second group uh, that was naive until day 17 was challenged with a salmonella type hemorrhea <coughs> isolate from our lab. And uh, at day 18, we challenged with Imeria maxima, and this was the M6 strain uh, originally uh, isolated in Florida, um, which we believe is much more virulent than the um, Guelph strain, which I'm going to show you some data for in a moment. Um, and then from day 22 to day 23, so in other ways, where it's after about five days, you're, you're ending the Imeria cycle itself, where, where the damage is due to the Imeria. And now you're starting the susceptibility to necrotic enteritis, which challenges those birds daily with an oral gavage of 10 to the 8 colony forming units of clostridium propregens. And what we saw here is generally body weight suppression. I cannot see that. Um, in the, from the non-challenged birds was maximal in the birds that were pre-challenged on day of hatch, but not day 17, uh, with salmonella type mirium and uh, similarly in the second experiment. Looking at the effects on body weight gain, looking at the challenge period from day 18 to day 25, which encompasses both the Imeria damage and the necrotic enteritis da damage, um, you see that the, the group, that uh, the third group over, um, that was exposed during the neonatal period to salmonella um, was much more severely affected. And we get to um, necrotic enteritis lesion scores at 25 days of age, and you can see that those birds that were challenged with, with salmonella on the day of hatch um, had higher lesion scores um, than the other groups, and the percent mortality was quite a bit different. Um, Zero percent mortality, and this was necrotic enteritis related mortality, 0% mortality in the non challenged group, Imeria and Clostridium propregens, 16% or 25% in experiment one and two, respectively, going up to 40% if those birds had been salmonella infected during the first week of life, um, and not much effect if they saw salmonella later in life. And these birds with salmonella, they were confirmed to be salmonella positive in those salmonella positive groups. We've looked at a very similar experiment uh, using the Guelph strain of Imeria maxima and uh, with salmonella on day of hatch, uh, day 18, Imeria maxima, and then days 22 through 24 um, devised with Clostridium perfringens. And what you can see here, during the 0 to 14 uh, day range up here at the top, 
looking at the just look at the body weight gain, uh, 348 grams in the non-challenge group versus 314 grams in the challenge group. During that phase, they only saw salmonella typhimurium. So we see this repeatedly in our laboratory under really controlled studies. We see hits on body weight gain and feed efficiency due to salmonella. It, it is a pathogen. It's an obligate pathogen. Um, it, it is sucking resources from that animal when they're salmonella infected. Um, moving down to body weight gain uh, during the period of 14 to 25 days, um, you can see that the combination is devastating in terms of, of body weight gain and overall body weight gain as well. And feed conversion rate, um, you're looking at uh, six point, uh, 40 points of feed efficiency. Um, so, and the subsequent experiment, we kind of blocked it out a little bit differently. And we looked at five days post Imeria challenge with the Guelph strain. And if you look at these first two bars um, in the non-challenged group, we saw that during this period, um, uh, during the five days post Imeria challenge, the non-challenged birds gained 387 grams, whereas the challenged birds only uh, gained 290 grams. That's a 25% reduction in body weight gain. That provides an opportunity for evaluating uh, candidates for prophylaxis for this disease um, that may be affecting the Imeria replication. Um, and then if we look at the three days post Clostridium perfringens challenge, where we're starting to see some necrotic enteritis, um, we similarly see a 271 gram increase in the non-challenged group but only a 36 gram increase in the challenge birds. Uh, that's an opportunity for looking at um, the, the effect of, the of a candidate compound or product uh, on Clostridium perfringens per se. And you can follow that out later and look at what the effect of some type of intervention might be on healing or recovery of these birds. One of the things that we've been doing to measure inflammation, gut inflammation, is to look at actually leaky gut. Leaky gut is a breakdown of the tight junctions um, that keep the enterocytes um, tightly bound together, that provides the barrier for very high numbers of bacteria, many opportunistic bacteria, lipopolysaccharides, exotoxins, and so forth that truly separate the animal from the digestive, a single cell layer, and when it becomes leaky, then these toxic molecules and even bacteria can leak between these cells. And um, what we use is a, a fluorescent marker. It's about $4,000. It's too big to be absorbed across intact intestinal epithelium. Um, and we administer that by garbage. We can take blood samples afterwards and measure the leakage of this large molecular weight fluorescent molecule into the circulation as a marker for how much damage that occurs. We can also, because the intestinal uh, venous drainage is through the hepatic portal vein, all the uh, venous drainage from the intestine goes to the liver. We can take liver samples, culture the liver, and actually determine bacterial translocation across that epithelium as another marker of leaky gut um, or bacterial leakage. Um, and what we see here is uh, on the left-hand panel, the serum fluorescent marker, a uh, large molecular weight marker, very little in the non-challenged birds and very high in the challenged birds. And so this is another tool um, and it matches pretty much with bacterial translocation. The, um, it's another tool that can be used for looking at anti-inflammatory effects or anti-inflammatory mitigation for inflammatory insults to the small intestine in, in birds. Um, uh, in this uh, experiment with the Guelph strain, we had uh, essentially no mortality looking at the right-hand side, but we had significant Clostridium perfringens lesion scores. And one of the things that we're looking at right now in an experiment that's on the ground right now 
is whether there's a difference in the acute mortality um, versus the enteritis that we see with the chronic enteritis. We think that the two mechanisms may be disparate and the mortality may actually be a rage-induced shock phenomenon um, where interventions might interfere with that acute, really paracute inflammatory disease. And we think that necrotic enteritis is in fact a acute disease in individual animals. It appears to be a chronic disease in a flock, but that's because the challenges are asynchronous. We're seeing mortality all the way along, but when we synchronize the challenges, it's a very acute disease and the birds that either die or they recover, and if they recover, they recover fully and begin some compensatory gain um, after about a week. Um, uh, okay, in this last experiment that I'm gonna present, uh, similar um, uh, day one salmonella challenge, uh, day 16 I marry challenge, day 21 clostridium perfringens, and uh, uh, we were able to look at the effect on body weight gain during these individual periods. So you can see what the effect of, of the salmonella challenge was. You can uh, look what the effect of the I marry challenge was, and you can look at even the recovery phase, where we see that during this recovery phase, uh, day 27 to 35 on the right-hand panel, um, the birds that were challenged um, were growing as, as fast in terms of body weight gain, but looking at the left panel, the far right pair of bars, that compensatory gain was not there yet. So uh, we, we have potential for compensatory gain um, in this model. Um, and uh, here's the mortality in the second study, uh, relatively low as compared to what we've previously done with Imeria Maxima, uh, M6 strain, and uh, we've got a side-by-side -side comparison ongoing uh, in our laboratory. So um, salmonella, we believe is, is predisposing. We've also done this with a salmonella and aridivus isolate. It also seems to be predisposing. I don't think it's anything particular about salmonella type of Miriam. Um, these are really just serovar differences. Um, the uh, Imeria maxima isolate itself may be very important, with some being more pathogenic than others. Um, uh, according to Professor Barda, um, the the Guelph strain and the M6 strain uh, do not cross protect immunology, immunologically, um, and uh, there's also evidence that they don't interbreed during the sexual cycle uh, of um, Imeria proliferation, which actually makes you think they might be different species. Did I get that right, Dr. Khan? Um, so, one of the things we're thinking here is in the third bullet that uh, some candidates <coughs> may be more likely to promote recovery of the epithe ep enteric epithelium, whereas others might be more protective for the infl inflammation-induced shock uh, and the paracute mortality that we see with this disease. Um, so we think we've got a, a, a model here that can be expanded and uh, any candidate um, intervention can be tested for multiple effects um, you know, through the life of the chicken. And I think commercial poultry typically go through all of the challenges that are included in this model. Not as severe and certainly not as synchronized as this model, um, but we're able to look at multiple facets of the disease progression itself. So with that, I think I uh, will be happy to entertain any questions, comments, or snide remarks. Thank <laughs> you.